Well, welcome to another episode of Christian Answers. My name is Pastor Jeff Short, and today I'm going to be talking about a uh, popular format for education online, which is called TED Talks or TEDx. You might find it under a number of different uh, permutations, but it's mostly TED Talks. And these are academic lectures. Uh, they usually range from maybe about 15 minutes to up to an hour. Usually it's more 15 minutes to 30 minutes to keep it digestible for the average student. I think the psychologists have said that the average student attention span today is 10 minutes max, but most of these lectures are between 15 and 30 minutes. So it does challenge the student, but then they also are able to learn more because there's more content in a 30 minute lecture than there is in a 10 minute lecture. So uh, TED Talks usually consists of some kind of a authority, maybe a professor, an academic uh, researcher, some noted specialist in a field, and they talk about all wide range of topics, usually at a college and university level, but high school students do utilize uh, TED Talks in their researches and reports at the high school level, and teachers are willing to accept TED Talks as footnotes and as author authoritative sources, just as they would even a book or magazine or journal article. So these talks, TED Talks, are recognized as somewhat authoritative, and they're a way to get people into the college and university classroom without actually being there. So they're sort of like a professor in a classroom taping his lectures and then presenting them to students who perhaps couldn't attend a lecture or can only go to college through distance learning. So it's kind of like a distance learning, continuing ed education. It's also for adults and probably mostly watched by adults, although probably young adults. And some universities and colleges even assign TED Talk lectures in the classroom. So these are are fairly well respected. They're, they're recognized as a legitimate educational source for content. Now, here's the problem. TED Talks has some pretty sick and twisted talks in their catalog, and children who are just given the open permission to go to TED Talks and watch anything they want on there will actually be exposing themselves to a lot of sick and twisted content. And it's not just the rabid atheists on there. It's not just the rabid uh, rampant materialism that's on there, the secularism. The whole tone of TED Talks is just oozing with secularism. And whenever it treats religion and Christianity it always kind of approaches it as if this is something that was man-made, this is something that was socially constructed, and we're going to deconstruct religion, we're going to deconstruct Christianity, we're going to deconstruct the Bible. It's mostly negative when it comes to the Bible and Christianity. So that's something we have to be careful of. But on top of that, it's also promoting a perverse view of sexuality. So I want to present to you a presentation by a Christian broadcaster who is really spot on as far as his analysis of TED Talks. So let's watch this and I'll come back and comment before the end of the program. Let's go ahead and watch this. I've made a prediction twice now that our culture is on a path towards accepting and normalizing pedophilia. The first time was in the Stay Free series and then the second time was in the War and Truth series. My reasoning for saying it in Stay Free was basically that we are watching the moral breakdown of our society today. The West has rejected God, rejected Christianity, rejected the moral underpinnings of our civilization that's guided us for 2,000 years, and therefore we're starting to see our civilization fall apart. 
What if the key signs that a civilization is indeed unraveling, and we see this time and time again from history, is that it starts to accept and promote sexual confusion. The most famous example from history is of course the Roman Empire. Historians have agreed for centuries that when the Romans started normalizing sexual confusion, it was an outward sign of inner moral decay that signaled that their civilization did not have long to go. That I believe is what we are witnessing in the West today. I came across this video recently from Camille Paglia that adds weight to that concept. On androgyny, I've always been fascinated, attracted you know, to the subject of androgyny, uh, and, and that's what the sexual persona is. I explored it in history. But the, the more I explored it, I realized that, um, that historically, this, uh, this, uh, the movement toward androgyny occurs in late phases of culture, okay? as, a, as if a civilization is starting to uh, unravel. Okay, and that, that you can find it again and again and again through history in the in, in the in the Greek art. Okay, you can you can see it happening. All of a sudden, okay, there's a, there's a kind of uh, you know the, the the sculptures of of um, of uh, handsome nude young men athletes that used to be very robust. Okay, in the archaic period, suddenly begin to seem like wet noodles. Okay, you know, toward the end. Okay, and that, uh, and that and that the people who 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 live in such periods, a late phase of culture. Whether it's, it's the Hellenistic era, whether it's the Roman Empire, whether it's, it's uh, the Mauve decade of Oscar Wilde in the 1890s, whether it's Weimar Germany, people who live at such times okay, feel that um, they're very sophisticated, they're very cosmopolitan. Okay? Homosexuality, heterosexuality, so what? Anything goes and so on. All right? and so, and but but we, from the perspective of, of historical distance, okay, you can see that it's a culture that no longer believes in itself. So sexual degradation, sexual confusion is a sign that culture is starting to break down. And although Camille Paglia didn't actually say it, what we see from history is that the advanced stages of that breakdown do tend to involve an acceptance of paedophilia. And then the second reason for predicting the eventual approval of paedophilia, and this is what I spoke about in the War and Truth series, is that the same arguments and the same set of liberal values that were used to successfully push the gay marriage agenda, those same arguments, those same values also hold true for the paedophile agenda. See, our culture has decided that the only value that we need is love. Therefore, if something is deemed a valid expression of love, and to this generation, it must be a good thing. Man and a woman, two men, two women, three men, doesn't matter to this generation. Love is love, love is all that matters, and no argument can stand against that in the postmodern era. You can counter appeal to righteousness, you can counter appeal to holiness, you can counter appeal to truth and data and statistics, but none of it will matter. Our culture has decided that love has no connection to any of those other values, and these other values certainly don't hold as much weight. Therefore, if paedophiles can successfully convince the world that their proclivity is just a natural expression of love, that they were born that way, that they're just a poor, marginalized minority who just want to love, that's all they would need to do to turn the tide in their favor in this generation. That's all the homosexual lobby had to do to turn the tide in their favor. That's all the paedophile lobby would need to do also. The gay lobby has shown them the way in this. They've shown them how to do this. So that's how we predicted they would go about it in the war and truth. Phase one, they would need to start trying to present themselves to the world in a more sympathetic light. Start trying to pull heartstrings. Start saying that they're marginalized and sad and say it's natural and just a valid expression of love and say that you can't help how you feel. Say these things and they will soon have the postmodernist sympathy, as shocking as that currently sounds to us. And that's in spite of the facts, that's in spite of morality, that's in spite of everything else, because frankly, the postmodernist doesn't give equal weight to any other value. In fact, this is how I said it would happen in the War and Truth series. Here's how it would likely happen. Left-leaning intellectuals will begin proposing with increasing boldness that paedophilia is just a natural proclivity. They will say that paedophiles are just a misunderstood, marginalized minority who deserve equality. Maybe a high-profile story will hit the news that will portray it in a sympathetic light. Perhaps a poster couple will emerge for the movement, and they'll tour the media channel saying that they're really in love, and it's an arrangement that works for them. New studies will be done that conclude that since the Greeks and Romans and other ancient civilizations 
organisations engaged in paedophilia, it must be natural. After it's been framed in the sympathetic way, the herd, not wanting to be seen as intolerant or bigoted or out of step with the group think, will then begin to support paedophile rights. Attitudes will relax, it will become more widely accepted in public, and anyone who opposes it will then be shouted down as an intolerant paedophobe. Those in power will come out as paedophiles themselves and they'll change the laws to suit their appetites. It will pass from rightly being seen as an evil to being seen as an unfortunate disorder to just being seen as a legitimate expression of love. From an evil to an unfortunate disorder worthy of our sympathy to a legitimate expression of love. That's the sequence I believe that we're going to see pursued in the future. Now the reason I'm making this video today is that just last week a friend of this ministry notified me that this is already starting to pick up pace and they are indeed using these exact tactics to try to turn the tide of public opinion. Firstly, they're now actively vying to be included under the LGBT umbrella. Secondly, they're rebranding themselves with more politically correct speech, calling themselves not paedophiles anymore, but instead minor attracted persons. Thirdly, they've adopted a version of the rainbow flag with soft pastel colours. And then fourthly, liberal academics are indeed already trying to present them in a more sympathetic light. What follows are clips from a TED talk given just last month at the University of Würzburg. Let me tell you about Jonas. Jonas is 19 years old. He studies law in Munich. In his spare time, he likes to play soccer. Jonas has a secret which he thinks he cannot share with anyone, not even with his best friend or with his parents. He's just too afraid of anger, rejection, and repulsion. Jonas knows that he has to suppress his sexual drive for his entire life. And he also knows that there will never be a loving and fulfilling partnership that he can enter. Because Jonas is a pedophile. He's only attracted to female children between the ages of 6 and 12 years. Like every other sexual orientation, pedophilia can have different characteristics. For example, it can be heterosexual, it can be homosexual, bisexual. Within the male population, 1 to 2 percent are considered to be pedophiles. This translates to about 60 million people worldwide. This is as much as the population of Italy or of South Africa. Therefore, pedophilia is not an irrelevant phenomenon we can't simply ignore. Chances every one of you knows at least one pedophile are higher than that you don't know anyone so generally speaking, anyone could be born a pedophile. It is crucial to understand the difference between pedophilia and child sexual abuse, which is illegal and must always be. Pedophilia is only the sexual preference for pre-adolescent children. The difference between child sexual abuse and pedophilia becomes very obvious when we look at scientific studies. Scientific studies indicate that only 20 to 30 percent of all child molesters are pedophiles. Not every pedophile abuses children. And not everyone who abuses children is a pedophile. Differentiating between these two groups is essential. Pedophilia is an unchangeable sexual orientation, just like, for example, heterosexuality. No one chooses to be a pedophile. No one can cease being one. Scientific studies indicate that one of the strongest predictors for child sexual abuse committed by pedophiles is social isolation. We can make a difference for Jonas. We as a society, can be there for him.
At the moment, we live in a world that already excludes pedophiles because of their preference alone. Someone who is lonely and excluded from society has little to lose and is at much higher risk to commit a crime like, for example, child sexual abuse. We can make Jonas feel that he stays a valuable member of our society, although he's a pedophile. Right now, most of us feel discomfort when we think about this scenario. And most of us feel discomfort when we think about pedophiles. But just like pedophiles, we are not responsible for our feelings. We do not choose them. But we are responsible for our actions. And we must make a decision. It is an our responsibility to reflect and to overcome our negative feelings about pedophiles and to treat them with the same respect we treat other people with. We should accept that pedophiles are people who have not chosen their sexuality and who, unlike most of us, will never be able to live it out freely if they want to lead an upright life. We should accept that pedophilia is a sexual preference, a thought, a feeling, and not an act. We should differentiate between child sexual abuse and pedophilia. We shouldn't increase the suffering of pedophiles by excluding them, by blaming and mocking them. By doing that, we increase their isolation and we increase the chance of child sexual abuse. My perspective has been completely changed by hearing Jonas's story, hearing about his cruel fate and understanding the difference between child sexual abuse and pedophilia. As a medical student with a background in psychology, I feel it as my responsibility to help others overcome and escape wrong stigmatization and to have a positive impact on our future society. So you can hopefully see the insidious nature of what was being said there. The attempt to invoke sympathy, to say that it's natural, that they can't help how they feel, to say that they're born that way, to say that we're marginalizing and excluding these poor people and that we're the ones to blame for causing child sexual abuse because we're being mean to poor Jonas and other people like him. These are the exact same arguments that were once used to soften public opinion to gay marriage and they're being used all over again. And my plea for this video is simply that we don't let this happen, not this time. This is pure evil, and there's a spiritual evil behind it all too. I wanted to make this video so that we are fully aware of the assault that's coming, so that we are aware of the tactics being implied, and so that we might be shocked into reevaluating where we're actually heading as a society today. Liberals have been saying for years that love is love, love is all that matters. But if you have nothing solid underlying that philosophy, if you don't connect your idea of love to righteousness, to wholesomeness, then you're gonna see the worst kinds of depravity, group marriages, pedophilia, bestiality, and incest, because every one of those groups will simply say that theirs is also a valid kind of love. So you would approve of the incest marriage then? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sure. <laughs> We can't let this happen. This isn't progressive, this is regressive. This is return to a depraved world that Christianity once managed to reform for the better. As we turn our back on God, our society is falling apart and surely everyone can see that. And if we don't take action now to return to those moral foundations, to return to the Bible, to return to God, we are going to regret this. Please world, do not let this happen. Well, as you can see, this was a very, very powerful presentation and expose of TED Talks. It's hard to imagine anyone with any responsibility would put this content on your educational catalog. It's hard to imagine that any adult at TED Talks, the organization, would sanction this, sponsor this, give this permission, uh, put this under the auspices of TED Talks when it is blatantly 
promoting a form of sexual perversion. It is blatantly contradicting the Western Christian, Judeo-Christian value system, and it's going way beyond anything that is even discussed right now in the mainstream media, and it's being tolerated. And, and just as the presentation presented, what happens is you start getting, as this sexual revolution that we are now in <clears throat> starts advancing, you begin to get more and more and more perversity, because it's an inch-by-inch gradual desensitization of the culture, desensitizing us in the process of moving us along away from the moral stand into immorality. For example, a few years ago, just five or ten years ago, if you had talked to most people today about uh, this so-called gay marriage proposal, they would have said no, definitely not. It contradicts the long-standing time in memorial definition of marriage. It's a contradiction in terms. A marriage by definition is a man and a woman. And so any kind of deviancy from the male-female binary uh, component of marriage is not marriage. And people would have said, obviously, this is not even something that should be debated. But here we are today, and we're now four years, approaching four years since the legalization of so-called gay marriage. And now, through the process of desensitizing the Cong or the masses, and even churches sometimes, the liberal churches, you're at a point today in society in Western world where most people, a majority of people, have now come to accept what was totally rejected just a generation ago. And this is the process and how it works. And so what's going to happen now is you're going to have the LGBT acronyms. You have the lesbian and gay. And now that's one, a majority of citizens acceptance. And then you have the uh, LGBT, the transgender. We noticed they're right after the Obergefell decision in 2015. We saw this whole push with Bruce Jenner, and we've got to get him on TV, and we've got to interview him, and Diane Sawyer and ABC News has to interview him, and they have to present him in the best possible light for the nation, and so we desensitize the nation further. And then a year or so takes place, and Bruce Jenner does his so-called transitioning surgery, and his operations and to move this part away and then bring other parts in and all kinds of uh, uh, surgical manipulation. And now people are getting used to that idea of a transgender Bruce Jenner, who once was supposedly one sex, but now he's another sex. And this mass confusion, gender identity confusion, and we see this happening time and time again. Well, we haven't dealt with the so-called B in the LGBT revolution, but that's coming. But now there's another whole perversion that's beginning to be talked about in the open, and that is the whole area of pedophilia. And if it's hard to believe that there is a reputable organization, some organization in the educational establishment now that actually considers pedophilia something that they can sponsor a presenter to give a positive spin on this sexual perversion. It's hard to believe it. And what is even more dangerous than just this organization accepting it is that when they release these videos and when they put their insignia TED Talk in front of it. Parents are supposed to feel good about the content. They're supposed to feel that they can trust this organization to be responsible and not presenting something totally out of line. But you know, that safeguard is no longer there. 
there are people at the TED Talks organization that obviously feel that this conversation needs to be had. Well, why does this conversation need to be had? Are we going to have a conversation about every single type of sexual perversity known to man? And are we at some point going to begin to try to normalize the process of every single sexual perversity? That's what the pattern is at this point. And so we have to stop as Christians and we say, no, no, we, we, we do not go down that slippery slope. I know a lot of people say, well, you're using the slippery slope argument. You're saying that, you know, once we go down that road, then this will happen and this will happen. And that's a fallacy, a slippery slope fallacy. It's not a fallacy if the actual trend of the direction of the slope can be demonstrated. In other words, it's not a fallacy. There are some slippery slope fallacies where people will make the claim, well, if you go this far, then what's going to happen next is this, and what's going to happen next is this, and it doesn't actually happen, and there's no actual pattern, but they're just trying to make a slippery slope that if you go this far, then this will happen, this will happen, but it's not there. In this instance, in regard to sexual perversity and immorality, it actually is a slippery slope, and it can be actually factually demonstrated. If you look back at the desensitization program of the LGBTQ movement, you will see that every time they add an acronym, it used to be LGBT, and now it's LGBTQ, and now it's LGBTQ+. And there's, the plus simply means that there are a ton of other acronyms that need to be added and will be added in the future but we're not there yet. That's their thinking. We're not there yet. We can't take people there yet because they aren't ready to accept all of this perversity all at one time. So we have to desensitize them this way. And then we have to go a little further. And then we have to go a little further. And then a few years later, you go a little further. And this whole problem with TED Talks is playing right into the slippery slope. Now, what is the next TED Talk that is going to be presented after they've moved on from pedophilia? What is it, bestiality? Is that, are we going to see a, a nice, attractive woman get on stage with the TED Talk backdrop and a crowd in the audience and the lighting and the video quality? Are we going to see someone some nice, attractive woman, professor, academic, get on stage and try to make a case for bestiality? You know, what is next? And you may say, well, that's just a crazy slippery slope argument. If I can show that along the way, there has been a slide and there is a slippery slope timeline, then it's not an, a fallacy. It's a, a reality. And so to parents, I would say, do not think that if your student, your child is telling you, well, I'm going to go on the internet and I'm going to listen to the lectures of TED Talks, don't think that they're safe. Don't feel in your heart, oh, good, they're really getting an education. They're really learning something. I can trust TED Talks. No, you cannot trust TED Talks. TED Talks cannot be trusted. So make sure you know what your child is watching on the internet. We'll see you back next week on another edition of Christian Answers. God bless. Mm -hmm.